Okay, so really quickly, what I'm going to do is prove to you that there's no rare earth crisis and that the Western world could enjoy a position of producing rare earths quite comfortably, including the heavies, and do it exclusively by using current flows of mining waste material. In that process, you will start accumulating a lot of thorium, and that's where John and I started working together because I couldn't solve the rare earth crisis without solving the thorium problem and uh, they're interlinked, and we're going to walk through how that, that works. Congressional failure equals commercial failure. There's probably 12 rare earth bills in Congress right now. Not a single bill. You could not find me a paragraph in a single bill in Congress that deals with the key issues. What do we do about China's sovereign monopoly? How do you do this without lowering BLM standards? Or how do you do this in a way that the United States can actually attract businesses here and technologies here. No, in fact, all they do is, is fund more studies of the same thing over and over in perpetuity, and it gives them something to hide behind while the problem continues. They offer loan guarantees to people very far down the value chain when the extreme amount of capital required to develop that refinery or that metallurgical facility is extremely high and you still have the Chinese monopoly looming over you. So what you're looking at is essentially setting uh, businesses up for failure because you've never dealt with the number one item. And uh, this, what John and I are working on does that. So there's no shortage of rare earths. Here's a letter from the University of Southern Florida that works with the phosphate industry. They basically throw away 200% of all the rare earths we need in this country every year. So let's just assume a 50% recovery. Okay, we're on the road. Here's an interesting graph that's been around forever. If you look down there, there's that little purple thing at the bottom, and that is a single industry called the heavy mineral sands industry. And at one time, they supplied the entire world with rare earths, and it was a byproduct of their regular business, basically titanium mining, uh, mineral sands mining for heavy elements like zirconium. So they were producing enough rare earths for a very long stretch to supply the whole world. And they actually got up to almost 20,000 tons a year of this byproduct, this waste byproduct. And as China entered the market, and as the thorium risks started to materialize, they just said, it's not worth it. And they've been dumping all of these monazites and xenotimes that are associated with their core business into tailings lakes. So there's just two examples of where you could meet 100% of America's rare earths, so that's now 100 plus 100, that's 200, okay? Let's take this a little further. Iron ore mines could easily produce another 100%. The heavy mineral sands, copper mines, uranium mines, aluminum mines, even rare earth mines. In fact, most of the rare earth mines that are trying to get funding right now can't get funding because they have a thorium problem. And all of the heavies are associated with thorium, and uh, they don't know what to do with it, so nobody will fund them. The mines that do get funded are mines like Mountain Pass, and Mountain Pass has, I think I've got it, they've got all of the lights and none of the heavies. So uh, essentially, you're, you're trying to solve your rare earth problem with half the rare earth, so it's not going to work. So monazite is the second most common mineralization of rare earths. It's the number one source of heavy rare earths on a global aggregate basis. If we could solve this thorium problem, there is no rare earth problem. And as John and I have been trying to convince Congress that if you could create a rare earth cooperative that could receive the thorium bearing monazites and essentially pull out the rare earths and then take the thorium liability and hand it over to an en another entity, something we could just simply call the thorium bank. And the thorium bank would have very simple, elegant, one sentence piece of legislation along with it that says Congress gives the thorium bank the authority to develop uses and markets for thorium, including energy. And with that single sentence, what you've done is you've created the big tent, the big tent for developing a thorium energy economy. And the way the legislation is currently written, it invites in all of our Western partners to be owners. And all of our Western partner owners would effectively also participate at the government level, at the national at the, and at the local level in the revenue streams to encourage uh, rapid acceptance and deployment of the technology. So this is what we're working on. The problem is 
as I said in the beginning, U.S. policy, most Western nations' policy, zero tolerance for actinides, assures that China will continue to control the rare earth market and all technologies related in perpetuity until we solve that problem because until you solve the problem, you will always be short heavy rare earths and without those, you're really not in the business of technology. So here's typical bass in the site. That's what everybody's mining today. That's basically half of the, the lanthanide series and very, very low levels of yttrium, questionable recovery. There's a typical monazite deposit. That's all of them. Uh, with monazite, you get other excellent mineralizations like xenotime with heavies. So what's the problem? What's the real problem? Regulation, liability, fear, and loathing. Okay, this word radiation, it causes irrationality in the public. They hear the word radiation and all of their receptors go up in panic. How radioactive is thorium? It's a low alpha emitter. It's got a half life of 12 and a half billion years. So really, it's not very active. It's not doing very much. How is it relative to risks uh, that we, ex we experience every day? Well, you know, you guys saw an image of a banana earlier. A banana with the, the potassium banana actually has a more harmful forms of radiation. When you cook on a natural gas stove, you're producing radon. That's much more dangerous. Sunlight, high altitudes, living in Denver, well, much more dangerous than wearing a thorium pendant around your neck. Um, let's move on and, and deal with it like adults, okay? Thorium uh, being treated fairly uh, on a parity basis with other industrial uses, you know, you could measure, you could measure that thorium is a hundred times or a thousand times or even a million times more safe than things that we use every day in industry. Take, for example, anhydrous ammonia. If I have an MFA cap on my head and I go into a, a farmer's co-op, I can get a 500-gallon tank of compressed uh, um, uh, anhydrous ammonia. I can drive back on my tractor, maybe I had a few, right? And I slip off the road right where the school bus is letting kids out. That anhydrous ammonia is going to kill every single person there or permanently scar them and deform them. We deal with it every day. Pesticides, things we use in paints, things we use to create glass, much more dangerous than thorium. I mean, especially the most important uh, non-risk factor is it's not water soluble. So really, if you took a handful of thorium the size of sand and you swallowed it, it's really not going to damage you in any, any significant way. John and I have discussed whether it's going to uh, disrupt your lower intestinal system because you have a lot of bacteria in there that needs it, but ultimately it passes right through. Your body doesn't upload it. So, so we go, oh, this is easy to fix. But the problem is the fear won't go away because we've all been trained to, to uh, you know, uh, just we overreact to this. So that's why John and I came up with the concept of this, this Thorium Storage and Industrial Products Corporation that's, that's a federally chartered entity, right? Something to give the public confidence, a federally chartered facility that's going to accept every single gram of thorium and all the other actinides that are produced and put away and stored very safely. But remember that one little thing we wanted, the, the authority to develop uses and in markets including energy. And that, that thorium bank would solve the rare earth crisis in the United States, in Japan, in Korea, in Europe. Everyone could participate and own, and own the offtake, because it would be a co-op. And then you would relegate the risk over to this facility. And this facility would be the big tent where everybody could come in and either contribute capital or IP. And everyone would be rewarded, everyone would own it. And collectively, we would combine our forces because it's a race. It's a race against us and a single-minded Chinese bureaucratic industrial policy that's intent on winning the race. And we're not going to win the race by throwing up a shingle and saying, I'm doing it first. We have to do it together. And this is the only way to do it. So what happens if you create this entity? From a rare earth side, basically it'll self-fund. Because if people, if, if Toshiba Hitachi and Siemens know they have a guaranteed offtake at the exact same proportion to their investment, the rare earth cooperatives instantly funded. And essentially, you make sure that none of the rare earths go outside of the value chain. You don't let speculators own it. 
And so that problem is, is over. And because it's, let's say, hopefully located here somewhere, um, it's also going to attract the manufacturing facilities and bring back the technology. It's going to create jobs. Congress is fully aware of this. John and I have met with pretty much everybody on the Senate Energy Committee, and we've met with all the, the key players on the House side. We've met with the administration. You know, as John said earlier, what are the obstacles? Oh, a cooperative. That sounds, that sounds awfully socialistic. And it, you know, they forgot how the highway system was built or how, you know, we, we led the world in avionics and et cetera, et cetera. And then the other complaint is, oh, thorium, that's radiation, that's scary, and we don't do scary. But um, we're, we're going to work through that, and, and we've got some commitments from some very senior people on both sides of the aisle to, to work through it. So just want to say I've just now solved the rare earth problem. Uh, let's move on to what I really care about, which is the energy issues. Sorry, to, I apologize to Fermilab, but the DOE is the ultimate in buggy whip bureaucracy. Um, you know, it, it, they, they basically, they, they, <laughs> they're promoting a technology that uh, operates at extreme pressure, low temperature, utilizes at best 5% of the energy, produces massive quantities of, of spent fuel that we have to deal with later that the public gets to pay for, and it's not economically viable by any measure. Um, so they're light water. You know, the light water, that's basically, it's the ultimate Frankenstein. It's the dual-purpose military civilian energy source that we're just going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. There's going to be a real fuel shortage for these, this new fleet we're going to build. In fact, there's going to be a fuel shortage for the existing fleet. So, and, and I th I'm sure somebody's pointed out while I was gone that Alvin Weinberg was essentially fired for putting safety first in nuclear. Okay, that's got to change. DOE's in the weapons business. So regulatory risk, if we can solve the regulatory risk, uh, we can put this whole thing all right. If we can solve the regulatory risk, you know, people like Google, people like Warren Buffett, uh, companies like Peabody Energy, the largest coal producer in the world, they're going to say, hey, I don't want to get left behind. I don't want to be the guy holding the buggy whip when the automobile comes by. And they're going to pile in, and we're going to build you know, we're going to be able to build these and roll them out in a cooperative effort where multiple nationalities who come in and step up to the plate all participate. Okay, so what's going on at the DOE is the Kodak moment, and if anybody owns the stock, I apologize. You've got to scream as loud as you can, why are we going to build a new fleet? There may not be fuel for it. It's got too many flaws. There's alternatives. John and I's uh, uh, legislative concept isn't asking the government for a dime. We're just saying, give us a pathway so that people can invest intelligently and safely. So we need to get off this, this, uh, this, this Kodak moment and move on to the future. The State Department and our government are essentially stuck in a paradigm where oil is the most important uh, energy commodity a lot of our international politics is driven by that, and some of it's quite ugly. And I just want to point out that China's way down there at the bottom, and as they and India become greater participants in what's called the industrial economy, you're going to have a well over 50% increase in the number of industrial in, uh, economy consumers of oil, and at the same time, those actual reserves shrink. So what do you think is going to happen? We're using it over here, and there's lots of people over there. There's lots of people over there who are going to pull it away from us, and we're going to experience something like this, but at, at levels that will not fit on this graph. You're talking about price shocks that nobody's ever seen before. And so every time those price shocks occur and oil gets up to about $100 a barrel, the entire Western world hits the brakes, and we can't move forward, and it's very uncomfortable. I want to point out something over on the edge of the graph. Origin of coal gasification, liquid fuels, circa 1800. How about 1820? Okay, the rich folks were burning oil from whales to light their homes at night. The poor people couldn't afford it, so they were burning oil from coal. Now it stunk a little bit, but by 1860, they figured out how to get the sulfur out. Problem is, in 1860, Spindletop happened, 
and then everybody was looking for oil and petroleum underground, and the, the vision of the geyser oil just took over, and everyone basically walked away from the oil from coal uh, paradigm until, let's say, oh, about 1942, when Germany recognized that they couldn't fight a war if they didn't have their own oil reserves. So they essentially powered their entire air force almost exclusively on fuels from coal and half of their ground forces from fuels from coal, liquid fuels. And the Allies didn't like fighting the German fighters because there was more energy in the fuel from coal than there was from the, in, the, in the, the energy inside a petroleum product. Much cleaner, by the way. So why is this important? Because these petroleum-centric policies are outdated, they're too expensive, they spread America and our allies' resources too far across the world, we've got to stop that. The future of energy is thorium, and I'm going to tell you why. It's all about the thermal profile. And with that thermal profile, you can convert America with the largest reserves of coal in the world, and the UK, of course, quite nice reserves, uh, got to be nice. Um, we can essentially become totally energy independent. In fact, how about if the United States becomes an exporter of energy? So I'm going to end it now, and I want you guys to really contemplate this. The evolution of economics and energy are integral, right? They've been bound from the very beginning. The first time a guy figured out how to yoke an animal to drag a stick that represented an early plow so he could plant something, and then fire and bronze, and then wind, and then water energy, and then coal, and then steam, and then oil, and all of a sudden, guess what happens? You know, we hit the brakes here on the economy because oil can't fuel the future anymore. It just can't do it. It's not dense enough. There's not enough of it. And every time we get another gallon, it costs more. So they made us a promise, right? They said, hey, there's this exciting age of nuclear energy and power's so cheap, you can't even meter it. It didn't happen. Why? Because we chose the path of solid fuels. Solid fuels have inherent problems and they create externality costs that are dumped onto the public that will be revealed to us one day. What I'm saying is there is a new nuclear age, but it's going to be a liquid fuel uh, system based on thorium, and that is how we're going to get there. And if we don't make that leap, and China does first, we'll be, we'll be leasing that power from them. We'll essentially all be paying a tax to them for every time we cook in our homes or heat our homes, turn on a light, or try to outproduce them at Walmart. Guess what? We lose. We've got to get there first, and I want everybody in this room to find out who your congressman's phone number is. Let's get something done. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Right on, Jim. Uh, if the uh, U.S. Uh, companies such as uh, Molycorp uh, take care of the thorium, will the price of the arenas increase, do you think? Uh, uh, Molycorp uh, controlled the political debate in our Congress uh, for all three years, or almost four years, I was lobbying this issue. Mali Corp has essentially defected, and they're now part of the Chinese monopoly. Mali Corp can only produce about half of the, of the uh, lanthanides, and they don't have, I've got to be careful what I say, the, their business model has some problems, and China's still a threat hanging over them. So they have essentially joined up with another company called Neo Materials that, in my opinion, is just an extension of the Chinese government. And they are now part of that monopoly, and they will be sending all of their valuable heavy rare earths to China for processing, and we won't see them here again. So Mali Corp is not the answer. Mali Corp was, was, was part of a chess piece that was played against the United States Congress and the public. Think about the irony of this. Mali Corp got American investors to fund the reopening of their mine for China's benefit. We were all played for chumps. And I think people in Congress are realizing it. I think they're angry about it. Uh, there was a very, very good op-ed letter by Congressman Kaufman, who's led the charge on rare earths. And I, I hope that, that the sting of what Mali Corp did resonates through Congress and they're willing to relook at the issue.